the Severn Valley and the Cotswolds contain some of England's finest countryside. To travel by train is one of the best ways to experience and enjoy its magnificent towns and villages, hills and rivers, castles and cathedrals. The railway travels through the heart of it all, with preserved steam lines, intercity, modern turbo units and even a cliff railway to carry us along the way. Our route follows the River Severn to Worcester before riding over the Cotswolds to the university town of Oxford. We begin in Bridgenorth, a small town on the River Severn, which is the northern terminus of the Severn Valley Railway. After British Rail closed the line in the 1960s, 16 miles were reopened as a preserved steam railway. The station houses the railway's engineering headquarters, where locomotives are maintained and heavy repairs are carried out. This line first opened in 1862 and was absorbed by the Great Western Railway. Small Prairie Tank, number 4566, was built by the Great Western in 1924. Bridge North was originally settled by the Saxons in the early 10th century. On Castle Rock, the ruins of an impressive Norman keep stand at a giddy angle. The castle was built in 1101 and blown up by the retreating royalists during the Civil War. Behind the castle is St Mary's Church, designed by the engineer Thomas Telford. St. Leonard's Church was founded more than 500 years earlier, in 1250. Its almshouses are still home to 10 poor widows of the town. The main street is dominated by the 17th century town hall and by Northgate, originally a prison. The town is full of old timbered buildings and many date from the time of the Tudors and Stuarts. Bridge North has the only inland cliff railway in Britain. It was opened in 1891 and was originally worked by water ballast. The lift is now electrically operated and provides easy access between the high and low town areas. Not far away is Stanmore Hall, home of the Midland Motor Museum. It houses a collection of over 100 sports cars, racing cars and motorcycles, including cars which raced at the pre-war Brooklyn circuit. Originally, the railway continued north to the Iron Bridge Gorge. The bridge, erected in 1779, was the first cast iron bridge in the world. Here, in 1709, Abraham Darby first used coke to smelt iron, a process which paved the way for the Industrial Revolution. This World Heritage Site houses a variety of museums, including Bliss Hill, where visitors step back in time to the 1800s. In the foundry, a cupola furnace is still used to smelt iron for traditional castings. The 
The machine shop is powered by a steam engine dating from 1840. The ironworks and its steam-powered rolling mills are even more impressive. Here, a blast furnace produces pig iron for the only wrought ironwork still operating in the Western world. Back at Bridge North, the great Marquis is about to depart down the valley for Kidderminster. Five arches of Old Bree Viaduct tower above Daniel's Mill. There has been a corn mill on this site since medieval times, and its 38 foot cast iron wheel is the largest in England. The Great Marquis is a K4 class mogul, or 260, built in 1938 by the London and North Eastern Railway. She spent most of her working life in Scotland and was saved from the scrapyard by Lord Lindsay, the Seven Valleys President. On the approach to Hampton Lode is Chelmarsh Reservoir, put to good use by the local yacht club. Hampton Lode is the first of four intermediate stations on the Seven Valley Railway. Number 2968 backs into the station. This Stanier Mogul was built in 1933 for the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. The Seven can be crossed here by the Hampton Lode ferry. The boat is held by a steel cable and propelled by the current which pushes against the rudder. During the summer, the railway operates three locomotives in steam, but there are dozens of resident engines. Number 46443 is a 1950 Ivert Mogul. On gala days, it gets very busy indeed. Arley stands on a quiet, unspoiled stretch of the river, one of the most beautiful villages on the line. A Great Western freight engine crosses the River Severn over a magnificent cast-iron bridge. When built, 
the Victoria Bridge was the largest cast iron clear span in the world. British Rail Standard Class 4 pulls into Bewdley. The station was once a busy junction with lines to Tenbury, Hartlebury and Kidderminster. Bewdley has been a market town for over 600 years. A river port Canal in Railway Centre, it provided a good foundation for local trades. There's a museum in the 18th century shambles where many traditional crafts are demonstrated. Back in the 1830s, the town boasted five separate rope makers. Clay pipes are shaped by hand then moulded before being fired in the kiln. This unusual Victorian saw was originally steam powered and was used by a local sawmill until 1984. The small round boat is known as a coracle. A typical River Severn coracle is made from an ash frame covered with unbleached calico which is then waterproofed with hot pitch. The Great Marquis pulls into Kidderminster and the connection with British Rail. The new station opened in 1984 on the site of an old goods yard. A Great Western signal box controls movements in the station area. Kidderminster can be traced back to Saxon times. An extensive network of canals was established before the railways and horse-drawn longboats served the town's many mills. Kidderminster was once the biggest carpet-making town in the world and produced the internationally famous Axminster carpets. Kidderminster is still served by British Rail and the old Starbridge extension line from Birmingham. South of Kidderminster, class 150 diesel sprinters head down through Droitwich and on into Worcester. of Dreitwich is a brine spa. It was settled in prehistoric times, exploited by the Romans, and finally developed into a fashionable retreat. The local spa water contains ten times more salt than seawater and is rivaled only by the Dead Sea.
Class 43 high-speed train pulls into Worcester's Shrub Hill Station. This was once an important center for the Great Western Railway. Its former elegance recalled in the cast iron and glazed tiles of the old waiting rooms and by a rake of preserved state carriages. The city of Worcester stands on the River Severn and is dominated by the cathedral. Rowing clubs regularly practice on this stretch of water. Part of the river has been given over to the swans. The cathedral was founded by St. Woolston more than 900 years ago and contains the tombs of King John and Prince Arthur. The oldest part of the city is Friar Street. The Grey Friars is an impressive timber-framed building which dates from 1480 and is now protected by the National Trust. The Tudor House Museum stands on the same street and was also built in the 15th century. The Guildhall is one of the finest civic buildings in the country. It was erected during the reign of Queen Anne in the early 18th century and commemorates the town's allegiance to the monarchy during the Civil War. A statue of Charles I has a place of honor while the head of Cromwell is nailed by his ears. Not far away, there's a statue of the famous composer Edward Elgar, who gave us pomp and circumstance, better known as land of hope and glory. The Worcester and Birmingham Canal runs through the city and past the commandery. In 1651, this was the headquarters of Charles II during the Battle of Worcester. It now houses a museum dedicated to England's bloody civil war. This whole court knows that the prisoner has refused to answer the charges brought against him by the people of England. For all his treasons and crimes, the said Charles Stuart, condemned as a tyrant, traitor, murderer and public enemy, shall be put to death by the severing of his head from his In body. In 1751, Dr. John Wall founded Royal Worcester, Britain's oldest China manufacturer. An impressive collection of porcelain is kept in the Dyson Perrins Museum. The Wigonia cream boat was one of the earliest pieces. Later work, such as the Lord Nelson service, is far more sophisticated. This magnificent plate is from a large banqueting service made for the coronation of William IV in 1831. These amazingly intricate pieces were are made of porcelain, the largest vase was for an exhibition in Chicago in 1893. All the tiny holes were individually cut out by hand by a man called George Owen who really perfected the art of China piercing or reticulation. Exceptionally skillful and amazing patience. The prison factory is open for regular tours. Today we shall see figurines being made. Now as many as 100 moulds can go to make a figure depending which figure it is we are making at the time. We make cream china, we also make white china. Usually if it's cream, then we don't decorate. This is how we retail it. The petals are made separately and stuck together with the slip. Four of these have been made for the... Worcester is also an attractive fixture for a day at the races.
at the station, an intercity high-speed train bound for Oxford departs on the Cotswold line. This route is also served by modern turbo units, seen here at Norton Junction. The line heads east through Pershaw and the Vale of Evesham, famous for its magnificent annual site of fruit blossom. This section of the Cotswold Line was opened in 1853 by the Oxford, Worcester and Wolverhampton Railway and was later absorbed by the Great Western Railway. Georgian town of Pershaw has been immortalized in poetry by Sir John Betjeman and is praised for its architectural importance. The imposing facades of High Street and Bridge Street include many inns and hotels as well as specialist shops which are renowned for miles around. The town stands on the River Avon. The old bridge which crosses the river was built by Benedictine monks who established control over the area in Saxon times. The Norman Abbey Church is Pershaw's most impressive feature. It was built and extended between the 11th and 14th centuries. Another station further up the river at Fladbury was closed in 1965. In contrast, the traffic on the Avon itself has been revived. A few far-sighted individuals succeeded in returning the river to navigable status, just in time for the leisure boom of the 80s. Oblivious to it all is Fladbury Mill, mentioned in a doomsday book, and still standing more than 900 years later. Evesham and a turbo unit stops by the timber signal box to exchange tokens with the signalman. Evesham nestles within a loop of the River Avon and since medieval times the Hampton Ferry has been there to carry people across. It claims to be the world's only rope-drawn ferry.
The history of Evesham revolves around its Benedictine monastery. It was founded in 714 by Egwin, Bishop of Worcester. Following the Battle of Evesham in 1265, pilgrims flocked from far and wide to see the remains of Simon de Montfort, who was buried in the abbey. The town has many fine old buildings, including the 14th century Armonry Museum. This museum of local history occupies the old home of the Abbey Armoner. A narrow alley leads to the Abbey gates, now an indoor shopping complex. The roundhouse is a superb 15th century half-timbered building, originally an inn, but since converted into a bank. On the other side of the Abbey Park, there are regular boat trips along the river on the Handsome Two. Next stop is Honeybourne, once the junction with a line now partly reopened by the Gloucestershire Warwickshire Railway. Behind the station is the Domestic Fowl Trust, where visitors can walk around 10 acres of small paddocks and ponds to see breeding flocks of hens, ducks, geese, turkeys and guinea fowl. To the south of Honeybourne is the romantic Cotswold village of Broadway reputed to be one of the most beautiful villages in the country. It's said to have been established after the Battle of Durham in 557 AD and is renowned for the length and breadth of its main street. On the Cotswold edge, High above the village is the Broadway Tower Country Park. The tower is a folly built in 1793 by the 6th Earl of Coventry as a present for his wife. The pre-Raphaelite artist William Morris used to stay there and a small museum commemorates his work. From the top of the tower, the views are magnificent. They encompass 12 counties.
The country park is also home to a number of deer, highland cattle, sheep, goats and even llamas. The Gloucestershire Warwickshire Railway is based at Toddington on the line of the old Cheltenham and Stratford Railway. Today, motive power is provided by Dumbleton Hall, a Great Western 460, built in 1929. The halls were a development of the earlier Saint class and were introduced by Charles Collard as a powerful general purpose engine. Maids of all work, they remained in service until the end of steam, and the survivors still do sterling work today. The preserved railway is now six miles long, and there are ambitious plans to restore the entire line between Cheltenham and Stratford. Having made up a train, Dumbleton Hall prepares to depart. The line passes the ruins of Hales Abbey, built in 1251 by the brother of Henry III. For 300 years, pilgrims flocked here to see a foul which is supposed to have contained the blood of Christ. In 1540, the abbey was demolished and the ruins are now in the care of English heritage. other station is at Winchcombe. The delightful narrow streets make this the prototype for Cotswold village. Old inns, black and white houses and even a police museum with stocks complete the picture. The town was built on wool and some of the money was used to erect the fine medieval church of St. Peter's. A small alleyway hides the Winchcombe Railway Museum. Here, a traditional Victorian garden has been crammed full of railway collectibles and memorabilia.
On the edge of the village stands Sudley Castle, one of England's most romantic stately homes. It was once the palace of Queen Catherine Parr, who remarried after the death of Henry VIII. The beautiful gardens belie a turbulent history. During the English Civil War, the castle became a royal headquarters and was destroyed by Cromwell's troops. Then it was acquired by the Dent Brocklehurst family, who embarked on an ambitious program of restoration and have lived here ever since. Castle Chapel contains the tomb of Catherine Parr, who refused Henry his dying wish that she be buried beside him in the royal vault at Windsor. From the station, the steam line continues towards Cheltenham. Reet Tunnel is 693 yards long and one of the longest in British preservation. On the other side, there are views over Greeton Village. Beyond Far Stanley, the line is incomplete and the hall must run around a train before returning to Toddington. Back to Honeybourne Station to continue the journey along the Cotswold Line. The track now climbs the Camden Bank amongst fields of oilseed rape. Britain's first 100 mile per hour train was officially recorded descending this bank. High on the Cotswold edge, kestrels hover on the air and the fields are grazed by sheep. In medieval times, their wool was a source of a prosperous local economy. On the other side is Chipping Camden and Morton in the Marsh. Chipping Camden was established in the 7th century. St. James's Church, built with the money from the flourishing wool trade, dates from 1260.
The gateway to Sir Baptist Hick's house is all that survives of his 11-acre mansion. Hick also built the market hall. Another wealthy inhabitant was William Greville, one of the country's most influential woolmen and financier to Richard II. The high street is an almost unbroken single terrace and is referred to as the most beautiful village street in Britain. Morton in the Marsh is the very distillation of Great Western country stations. The leisurely charm is still very much in evidence. The railway first arrived here in 1826 when Morton was the terminus of a four foot gauge tramway from Stratford. Morton straddles the Fosse Way, an ancient Roman road. In the centre, the road narrows between the market hall and the 16th century curfew tower. There's also an aviation museum, which commemorates the Second World War Wellington bomber. flight of a different kind is just up the road at the Cotswold Falconry Centre. There are lanner falcons, golden eagles and many other birds of prey. A Harris hawk and a group of black kites feature in today's flying demonstration. I'm at nice and straight and level to start with. We feel how gently you land. Okay. At one time, the kites were insectivorous, or black kites were insectivorous, taking insects on the wing. But now, mainly they're scavengers, scavenging through all the big towns and cities of the world. descends into the valley of the Evenload to Charlbury and Hanborough. Cornbury House on the outskirts of Charlbury has a fine deer park and the woodland walks are teeming with wildlife. The neat little Brunellian station is also very busy, especially during the rush hour. Further down the valley is Northlee Roman Villa. The site was uncovered in 1816 
and is preserved by English heritage along with a splendid tiled mosaic. Further along, there's an ancient water mill. Cool Mill was built in the early 1600s, and was, part of it was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. The main source of power was originally derived from a water wheel, water being drawn from the even load. This power system was later supplemented by the installation of a steam driven beam engine. The beam engine is Cornish reciprocating condensing engine. The steam is supplied by a Cornish boiler, single furnace boiler, and we steam four Sundays in the year for the general public. In 1965, Sir Winston Churchill's body was brought from Hanborough Station and he was given a quiet family burial in the nearby churchyard at Blayton. I wish I had left to see. He died ten years before I was born. Churchill's family home was Blenheim Palace, built for John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, in recognition of his victory over the French at the Battle of Blenheim in 1704. The palace is set in 2,000 acres of parkland, which was landscaped by Capability Brown. Blenheim Lake is spanned by Vanbrugh's Grand Bridge. Port Meadow on the approach to Oxford and our turbo unit is met by a northbound freight train. Oxford has a new station built in 1990. 146 years after the very first trains arrived from Didcot. Oxford, 
the city of dreaming spires, is crammed with ceremonial buildings and churches, one of the glories of England's heritage. Regular guided tours take in the sights and the history. Oxford dates back to Saxon times, when there was an ox drover's ford on the River Thames. Carfax Tower survives as part of a 14th century church, but other ancient churches are still in use. Rickshaws are the latest conveyance, but the most popular form of transport is still the bicycle. From 1167, the city won a reputation as a seat of learning, when English scholars, banned from the University of Paris, began to congregate here. 38 colleges are clustered around the centre. They all evolved in the same basic pattern. It's still apparent today in a monastery-like layout of chapel, dining hall, and inner quadrangle, with scholars' rooms set around them like cloisters. Christ Church College was founded in 1525 by Cardinal Wolsey. Charles Dodgson, alias Lewis Carroll, taught mathematics here. Its chapel serves as the city's cathedral. Other important buildings include the Bodleian Library, founded in 1598. It receives a copy of every book published in Britain and now contains more than five million volumes. It also houses a nice collection of gargoyles. The Sheldonian Theatre was built in 1669 by the young Christopher Wren and is used for degree ceremonies and concerts. The great domed drum of the Ratcliffe camera was England's first round library. It stands next to the restored University Church of St. Mary. The botanic gardens were the first to grow plants for scientific study. The glass houses line the river Cherwell, where in summer Hunters depart from beneath Magdalen Bridge. Leaving Oxford, the line continues south to a major junction at Didcot Parkway. Here, the Great Western Railway Society have created the Didcot Railway Centre. The centre is based on the old motive power depot at Didcot, which closed in 1965. Society has been formed for over 30 years, and the main reasons for it is to preserve anything and everything to do with the Great Western Railway. Luckily we have a Great Western engine shed, which is behind me at the moment. We've also various other relics of, of the Great Western Railway. We have uh, various uh, engines and carriages which people can uh, travel in or, and behind the engines. It's very much a Great Western Railway site. There are two demonstration lines. The first plays host to number 1466. 1466 is a Great Western 042 tank engine introduced by Charles Collett in 1932 for light branch line work. On this occasion, she's helping to demonstrate Great Western signaling.
in the locomotive works, a King-class engine is being rebuilt for mainline running. In the yards, a couple of preserved diesels engage in a bit of shunting. On the far side of the site is the railway's main line. Pannier tank number 3732 was built in 1937. She is one of the Great Western's standard shunting and general purpose tank engines.